Hi everyone and welcome to the Better Everyday YouTube channel. My name is Randy. So recently I did my first reaction to Thomas Soul. Soul? Um, and quite a few people suggested, oh, I haven't watched it. I have it in the middle with headphones off. I put it in the middle and press play to see where it's at on the audio before I actually record. But quite a few people suggested that I watch this clip, Thomas Soul on Black Redneck Culture. I don't know what black redneck culture is. I know some black rednecks that are proud to say they are, um, but I haven't heard of it being like a culture. I don't know. So I'm excited and intrigued to see what this is all about. So without further ado, here we go. Hopefully it doesn't get blocked. Like I mean, the, the, the average of, of black kid today, I think, is probably uh, better off, certainly materially, than uh, say Ben Ben Carson was when he was growing up. Ben Carson, the famous uh, black surgeon at Johns Hopkins. Right, right. I know who uh, Ben Carson is. immensely accomplished in every way. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, I would say that um, certainly the black kids who uh, are growing up today have a higher material standard of living than I had. Uh, the only the differ difference was that uh, the schools were good when I came along. They were especially good in New York at that time, hard as that is to believe. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the kids who grew up that, in that same place where I lived, they will not get that same education. Now oh, that can shame. be blamed on somebody, but it has very little to do with what happened uh, 100 or 200 years ago. So he's mentioned two different things, material... Uh, material, uh, I guess, not status, but just, I'm guessing how many things uh, kids have today versus when he was younger. He's specifically talking about black kids. But I would also say, I mean, well, I don't know about everybody, but for example, even my child has more things than I did when I was a kid, so I don't know if that means that I've put too much into things for my kid, if it's, you know, if well, I would argue society is more materialistic today, but that's not what he's saying exactly. He's saying that children today have more material goods or are in a better place materialistically than when he was young, and that when he was young, education was better than today if you were to look at the same place and that is that's a shame if that is the case that the same county let's say does not deliver as good of an education today as it did 30 years ago 40 years ago I don't know how long and it's true in other countries I mean uh, in Nigeria for example there's a tribe the Ebos who were living in one of the least, least fertile parts of Nigeria, uh, who were in fact enslaved uh, in centuries past by other tribes and so on. Uh, when, when the British moved in and set up schools, the Igbos went for the schools. By the time Nigeria became uh, independent, the Igbos had climbed above the other groups that had been ahead of them to, uh, to begin with. So there, but there are all kinds of uh, cross currents of factors uh, the particular culture or the particular geography, you run through the whole list of them. Here's, you cite, in Intellectuals and Race, you cite an observation by the intelligence expert, IQ scientist, James Flynn, that just stopped me cold. Mm. After the Second World War, you've got large numbers of, of American troops remaining in Germany. For that mm. matter, there's still several tens of thousands there today. And both black and white American soldiers had children with German women. Mm. And Flynn discovered that those children growing up in Germany mm. showed no IQ differences at all. Mm. The, the, the black kids and the white kids, the same. Mm. Quote, quoting intellectuals and race, Professor Flynn concluded that the reason was that the offspring Science of backwards. black soldiers in Germany, and now you're quoting Professor Flynn, grew up in a nation with no black subculture. Yeah. I was going to say, is it the cultural difference? Which means what? Which means they experienced exactly the same expectations, 
Is this the thing? No, no, no. The expectations are external. The culture in which they grew up with was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. So they had... There's no gangster rap. In, uh, uh, that, that was pervasively uh, uh, available in Germany. So here's what I'm getting. There is something about black subculture in America today that holds African Americans themselves back? Yes. In fact, I, I, I went into this in a previous uh, book on which... Uh, uh, about black rednecks and white liberals, because that same let's, subculture. We'll, we'll, let's talk about two of your books here. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Book. Tell me in the comments how many books has he written? That's interesting about the kids growing up in Germany. I have family members that spent time in Germany in the service. Um, that's super interesting. So he is saying largely um, the difference is largely a result of cultural differences. I think I said that right. I said difference twice in the same sentence. I'm sorry, clearly I need caffeine. Um, but it makes you wonder what else. Because as someone who is in a doctoral pro program and you know does research and questions things and tries to find things that go into it, I know that there's in my experience, that's never one thing. There are different uh, variables in play for things, but I see what he's saying about cultural differences and uh, the United States versus Germany. I'm because that very sub same subculture held white, whites in the South back as well. That in the time, this, this uh, mental testing in the First World War turned up, among other things, the fact that uh, whites from various, oh, four or five Southern states scored lower on the mental test than, than blacks from four or five northern states. And so it really was a question of the subculture that was there, which was a handicap to both. All right. And so whose job is it to say, wrong subculture, folks, you're, har you're harming yourselves? Well, I would think in an ideal world that intellectuals might take on that task. But yeah. uh, the world that we live in, I've noticed, is not, not ideal. All right. <sighs> what is to be done? Take a look at President Lyndon Johnson speaking at Howard University in 1965. Oh, yeah. But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire yeah. and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others. Yeah. And still justly believe that you have been completely fair. It's, it's pathetic. It's not a question of, there's no you who has the control to be completely fair or completely unfair. I mean, the circumstances are, so someone once criticized the mental test on grounds that the tests were unfair. And, uh, one, and I think it was David Reisman who said, the tests are not unfair, life is unfair, and the tests are no. measuring the results. But who has control of life? Who has no. control of the past? Who has control of the culture that people have in the present, which they've inherited from the past? Yeah. Mm. So Lyndon Johnson, he's been, in fact, although good liberal that he was, at least in regard, Lyndon Johnson had a complicated career and changed positions on issues many times, but good liberal though he was at that moment, he was in fact engaging in a breathtaking arrogance. Yes. On two counts. One, that Arrogance. white people were the ones who were responsible for where black people stood in the race. Okay. That it was up to whites entirely. That blacks, as he described, I mean, I'm devastating. It's a devastating. They're acted upon. That's right. That's right. And then the second act of arrogance is the supposition that somehow the federal government could fix it. Oh. Yes. Uh, See, it, it, I didn't think that far into what that man was saying. So the person interviewing Dr. Soul 
he, he he's got <laughs> he's better at really thinking into more than just face value you know if somebody tells you something there's always something behind it or I would say almost always at least and sometimes you just hear what's on the edge and don't really hear the less direct message that man did it is staggering uh, but if, if you wanted to be charitable, you could say, well, he said this in 1965. But if you say, all right, why are people now repeating it in 2013 when we've had uh, uh, nearly half a century uh, yeah. of experience to the contrary? And if you look within the black community, those blacks who had escaped what I call the black redneck culture, they've moved on. So, but it is, it's, in, it's, 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 it's the culture that different parts of the black community had. They were, they were different. Mm. Daniel Patrick Moyne. What does he mean when he says black redneck? Because when I think black redneck, I think redneck is with darker skin. Big trucks, the hat that's bent, dips tobacco, likes to drink beer, talks country. <laughs> I don't know if that was good or not. Oh my goodness, people keep calling me. Sorry. Um, oh, that's my dad. Let me pause. I apologize for the abrupt pause. It was, well, it was my dad's phone. It wasn't my dad. That was my son. My oldest son went back with my dad today uh, out of state. They were letting me know they made it okay. Yay. One child down for the next week-ish. Anyway, uh, I was talking about what I knew to be black redneck, but I don't know if he means that or not because to me, what that term would mean there aren't many that I know of at least just in my experience it's it's not a large percentage of people you know um, so I wonder if he means something different by then so let me know in the comments what he means by the term black redneck and if he means I, I don't think like I feel like based off what they're saying he doesn't mean big trucks and that type of thing. Just tell me in the comments. Community had. They were, they were different. Mm. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in his famous 1965 report entitled, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action. Close quote. 1965? Longish, longish quotation, but it gets to something, I believe. Moynihan, the fundamental problem is that of family structure. The Negro family in the urban ghettos is crumbling. A middle class has managed to save itself, mm. but for vast numbers of the unskilled and poorly educated, the fabric of conventional social relationships has all but disintegrated. So long as this situation persists, the cycle of poverty and disadvantage will continue to repeat itself." Close quote. When Moynihan wrote those words, the illegitimacy rate among African Americans was 25%. Mm. Today, the illegitimacy rate among white Americans is 36 percent, mm. among Hispanics, more than 50 percent, and among African Americans, more than 70 percent. Yes. Illegitimacy. I thought he said illiteracy, um, like not being able to read. Illegitimacy. Does that mean children born out of wedlock or having only one parent? Because at this point, I feel like a lot of kids are born out of wedlock. But does he mean not having both parents in the home? And among African Americans, more than 70%. Yeah. 70%? Aside from throwing 70%? up your hands in despair, what, how, what, what is to be done? First, the first thing to be done is to understand that this was a result of policies begun in the 1960s. This is not a legacy of what happened 100 years before the 1960s. The breakdown of the black family is not a legacy of slavery. No, if you, uh, the, the, the classic study of this goes all the way back to the era of slavery, and they find that most uh, black kids, even under slavery, had lived with two, with two parents. And that was okay, true so all the way parents. up until the 1960s. Uh, and so you, if you really want to find out what has happened, government changed, benefits. it has changed since the 1960s. And the fact that, that, that whites now have a higher rate of illegitimacy than blacks had when Moynihan wrote suggests that this is something that spreads out. But, but if you look at something else, if you look at those blacks 
I look at black husband wife families. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, poverty rate among such families has been in single digits ever since every year since 1994. See? And so, it's, so, we, so if you look at the if you look at the external causes, why the the, the, the husband and wife families and the uh, welfare single mo mom families all are, are facing the same uh, society and objective things. But the, but the results are radically different because the cultures and values are different. So you would, you would roll back welfare. I guess that's the principal policy. You, 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 let's, okay, so what would Tom Sowell do? One, you'd, roll, you'd eliminate welfare, you'd reform welfare. What would you do? Roll it back. All right. Temporary. And what about affirmative action? Eliminate it. Just gone. Yeah. Colorblind yeah. policy oh. completely. Really quick, I want to uh, mention, because I know, uh, I want to say like 30-something percent of the people that watch my videos are not in the United States. No, 30 percent of the people watching my videos are in the United Kingdom, and only 30 percent are actually in the United States, and the other 40 percent are kind of everywhere. Um, I don't know tons and tons and tons of people on benefits, but I know quite a few. I myself was on them for a while after I had my first son. Um, I, well, we'll just say that it was just me and him for a little while. And I was on assistance from different, couple of different things. And I didn't want for anything. I'm speaking from my experience here. And then when it wasn't just he and I anymore, and there was a man in the house, update, lost those things. Um, and in some ways, I benefited more from having those things, and in other ways, I didn't, obviously. Um, I worked at a bank for a few years, and there was this woman, again, I know a fair amount of people, on that received benefits, and I'm not saying anything about benefits specifically um but i'm using this example of a girl i worked with i think her name was like natalie started with an n i don't know but she made pretty good money and her husband such boyfriend i don't know he got paid cash but there was a promotion available at our job and she had been there longer and i suggested that she take it and she didn't want to because she was almost to the line of losing the benefits that they received. She received food assistance. Um, I want to say she got like 400 and something a month of food assistance. It might have been more than that. And medical for her child. And I think there was something else. But her husband slash boyfriend's stuff was not reported because she I don't know if she said that he lived with her or not. I didn't see her application, but she turned down an opportunity for what would have been another probably two to four hundred dollars a month if I had to guess from where she was at already. Because when she lost those things, she would have ultimately been doing worse than she was doing at the place she was. Again, if I. Uh, I'm going to guess some people will miss, maybe take that a certain way, but it's an example. There are benefits to those things, but also there are people that abuse them. You know what I mean? Um, anyway. Yeah. Colorblind yeah. policy completely. All right. What prospect for that do you see? None. No black, no black leader of any standing. I'm talking about a political leader as opposed to an intellectual such right. as yourself. You've got, well, there's you, there's Walter Williams. Uh, is there, do you get the sense that there's, a, that, that there's a growing generation, a rising generation of African-American intellectuals who say, enough of this, I'm with Tom Sowell? Well, I don't know if they'll go that far. There's no point <laughs> that being, would be asking a lot. Being, there's no <laughs> point being reckless. <laughs> But uh, people don't like him. I, I think uh, there are people like like uh, Shelby Steele and many others, uh, Larry Elder. You can run through a long list, and there are more such pe more such people now than there were say in the 1970s. 
But in terms of political leaders, all the, all the incentives politically are for, for black leaders to blame all problems in the black community on the larger society. And that enables them to take on the role of being the defender of the black community against enemies, which in turn uh, creates the situation in which many blacks don't feel that anything that they do is going is to help themselves unless it's done politically as, as a group. That there's no point. I mean, why, why would you, if you that's believe what, the, what, that's what they say, why would you want to knock yourself out in the school knowing that the man is not going to let you get anywhere? One of the most pathetic things I heard in recent years was a young black man saying that, you know, at one point he thought he would join the Air Force and become a pilot. That's and awesome. then he says he realized that the white man is not going to let a black man become a pilot. And he was saying this decades after the Tennessee Airmen had established their reputation in combat in Europe. You know, but, he, but the hopelessness... Hopelessness is, is one of the big products of the, of the race industry, that, that you, have, you have no chance. I remember giving a That's talk horrible. at Marquette, and at the end of the talk, among the questions that was asked, a young, again, young black man got up and he said, even though I am graduating from Marquette a University, what hope is there for me? And uh, having gone through college when I was in the 50s, I don't remember any blacks saying that in the 1950s when there was a lot more obstacles to overcome than there were when this yeah. guy's graduating from Marquette. But you, but you have to pr pr produce that kind of feeling in order to serve the interests of those in the race industry. Final question. That's, <clears throat> that's depressing. Maybe we, can, maybe we can think in terms of that young man at Marquette. Or let, let's put it this way. Somewhere, watching this interview, there's a young Thomas Sowell. There's an African-American who's smart and wants to do something with his life. What's, it se seems to me I've al we've already got one piece of advice you'd offer to him is stay away from the, from the races industry. Stay away from the what, race what hustlers. Ad, what advi uh, race hustlers. What advice would you give a young Thomas Sowell? How do you make something of yourself as an African-American in America today? the way anybody else would. You equip yourself with skills that people are willing to pay for. Oh, oh that was abrupt. Something I was expecting there to be more in his answer. You equip yourselves with skills that people are willing to pay for. Boom, it's over. That was really interesting. There was nothing in there that suggested to me, except for when he mentioned the South. But otherwise, I don't think that he was at all when he said black rednecks talking about the same thing as I know that to as I would have thought that would have meant um but that was a really interesting conversation it makes me curious about the book um about reading it let me know what else from Thomas Sowell that I should check out and I really like these like interviews with him people asking questions because there's this back and forth and it kind of gives it this extra dynamic or something or makes it more dynamic more interesting i don't know i enjoyed it let me know what you thought of the video and what else to check out from um, dr soul and i'll see y'all next time have a good one mm -hmm.